Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Animal Crossing New Horizons. I'm Nye. Right now in Isle Techni, it is 11.31 a.m. on Sunday, May 10th, 2020. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, and so on out there. Today, we have visitors staying at the campsite, apparently. And that's about it. Okay, well, I suppose we can go uh, visit with this visitor, maybe, possibly, if I actually remember to do so. Okay, what do we got going on here? So, stuff from the Nook Mileage uh, program that I ordered. We'll go ahead and go put that away in a minute. Got Only Me, which I think I already had. Konichinawa T and the Happy Hood Academy. 121334. We got a bed, a chair, a table, and a closet. Our home is homier than ever. And we get a new gift. And that new gift happens to be, well, let's take a look. So, we got... Solar panel, wind turbine, parabolic antenna, only me, the Konichiwa T, and a record box. Funny, I was kind of expecting to see like a gold HHA uh, thing. Maybe my points aren't high enough for that. I should probably start theming my other rooms, especially my top room. Uh, do I? Okay, we already have only me. Cool. Moving on. So, uh, yeah, not much going on. I did get to spend some time with my mom. Uh, we, we've had actually some some excellent news today. Today, uh, really the past 24 to 48 hours has been a reasonably good day in my house. Uh, our, uh, our cat got out a month ago. Uh... Which was a terrible time, because this cat's been with us for a good long time. Uh, Ignatius. Iggy, if you prefer. And he's uh, a wonderful cat. He's the cuddliest thing. He actively will, you know, snuggle up with you. Like, he is he is a cat that does want to give you time. I think I'm moving off the island. Well, that sucks. Hmm. Do we want to let Peanut move out? I mean, I like Peanut, but... Don't go. I mean, we should probably swap out villagers at some point, but, uh, you know. Don't, don't want to do that now. Okay, what time is it right now? It is 11.33, so i got 27 minutes before I have to go make sure I buy stuff from, uh, Daisy May. But yeah, he got out. Uh, unfortunately, this was mostly my fault. Um, as part of my biking, uh, I do have to open up the garage, uh, in order to get my bike out. And, uh, there's a cap door in the door between, uh, our den and our garage. And apparently when I opened up the garage door in order to put my bike away on the way back from such an excursion, uh, Iggy got out and vanished into the ether. Now, I live in a kind of suburban area... Uh, so, uh, lots of just, like, you know, little, calm, sleepy, uh, streets around here. So, you know, that wasn't too much problem, but the problem is we live on the corner of a rather major roadway. So, there was every worry that Iggy would be, you know, hit by a car or something like that. There was also concerns that Iggy would be maybe picked up by raccoons. So, we spent a lot of time just searching for him, looking for him everywhere, uh, with no luck. And, uh, event, you know, we, we posted about it on social media and stuff like that. But eventually someone said, look, you know, not everybody is on social media. You should put out the old-fashioned flyer. So, Mom did just that the other day. And lo and behold, one flyer that we attached to a telephone pole apparently breaks off in some of the high winds we had. And, uh, well, that sucks in multiple ways. But one such flyer breaks off in the wind... Proceeds to, uh, flutter down onto some woman's, uh, some woman's porch or lawn or something like that. And, uh, this woman left her house because she had, I guess, a cramp or something from a, uh, because of a recent, uh, surgery that she had. Saw the flyer and went, wait a second. I think I recognize that cat. I think that is the cat that has been coming around every so often. 
Uh, and then they called us, and we went over and looked and, you know, didn't, didn't find him. But they said, look, you know, you came here at, like, 7 p.m. He doesn't usually come around until 9. So we said, okay. So as we're kind of wandering back, uh, the family passes a empty house. Uh, this house has been, um, what is this and why is it expensive? A ring. Oh, okay. Of course it is. I'll think about it. Uh, but we pass this kind of empty house, and this house has been empty for, you know, some time. It's It, it needs to be bought. Um, but we pass this empty house, and the thought is, you know, let's, let's check around here, because he may be somewhere. So they check underneath the porch. They don't see anything. My sister, with better eyesight, goes, hey, Mom, I think I see a cat under here. And they start calling to him, and he actually starts coming to them. It turns out it was Iggy. Uh, so he has been a month in, in the wild, in the wilderness, uh, and uh, is absolutely fine. He's significantly thinner, which he used to be quite a chonky boy. Uh, he is now considerably thinner now than he was before, uh, which is probably a good thing. He's also lost a fair amount of fur, but I think that's mostly just because he's he's transitioning into a into a summer coat rather than, uh, you know, an indication that anything's wrong. He's been definitely fed by... Um, by these neighbors. So, uh, he, he is now home. It was probably the best Mother's Day gift that my mom could have asked for. Uh, which is, I think, f fantastic. So, we had that. Uh, we had a Mother's Day brunch in the house. Uh, since we're, we're still not, uh, we're still not going out. Um, we had Mother's Day brunch in the house. You know, some, uh, eggs and toast and, uh, grits. Wasteful celebrity. Oh, active island resident. You've been active for 50 days. Sleepless adventure. So yeah, we're still not going out. So, you know, grits, bacon, eggs, uh, toast, and that was that was our brunch. Uh, rather pleasant. Uh, my sister's boyfriend came over. Uh, other sister's boyfriend lives with us, so he was here too. Just kind of all all pleasantness, having having everybody in the house together. Uh, generally a good time. And, you know, we kind of hung out. It was, it was a nice, it was a nice day. You know, didn't have to be anything, uh, major or anything, anything big that we did. Uh, just spending time with mom, all of her, all of her kids together. Very pleasant time. I hope you guys have had a, had a good Mother's Day. I hope, I hope those of you who are mothers did get to enjoy the day for you. That, you know, your kids or your significant other or whoever uh, did give you plenty of attention unto yourself. Let you feel special. Haven't really been doing much uh, today other than that. I spent some time playing League. Uh, so a little bit of time playing Final Fantasy last night. Was watching a... Been watching a friend who's, uh, who's an artist... And uh, they're doing an art stream today. And so I've been kind of watching them. They've been doing uh, commissions and such like that. Mini requests. Things of that nature. Uh, which is always fun to watch. You know, I, I love watching people who are creative. Especially visually. Uh, I'm very much not a visually creative person. I don't have that skill. As you may guess by watching my Animal Crossing footage. Where I proceed to not do anything entertaining visually. Okay, Daisy May, what's your price today? 101 bells each. Ooh, ooh. That's, uh... I mean, I could probably get, a, a, you know, a thing from that. It is, you know, very likely that I could actually make some money uh, at 101 bells. Definitely. But, um... I don't know. But yeah, a, uh, a friend of mine is uh, doing their doing their art stream, which is uh, quite pleasant. It's quite fun, and they've been you know watching movies as they do, and they've been kind of streaming the, streaming the movie with us at the same time as they stream the art stream. And uh, we we got to watch some kind of old timey movies. So I I tuned in towards the end of Mary Poppins, uh, which I haven't seen Mary Poppins in a very long time, but it's amazing with with Disney movies specifically just how much this stuff 
stays with you. Like, when I say that, I mean, like, I was singing along with the music. I was actually, you know, I actually could think of the words. Let's go fly a kite up to the highest height. Let's go fly a kite and send it soaring. Like, these are, these are songs that I have not heard in 10 years. Something like that. And I don't know if it says as much how many times I might have watched these movies as a child... Or if it says to what extent the songwriting is fantastic and catchy. Uh, or perhaps the fact that I can just memorize lyrics to songs, I guess. Uh, but it, it just kind of goes and sh shows like just how how good that, that songwriting is. How pleasant it is. It was, a very, uh, it was very fun watching that. And then Bed Knobs and Broomsticks was the next one. Uh, it actually, the two of those, uh, the, those two movies actually have me very much considering uh, doing Disney Plus, just so I can watch some of the older Disney movies, uh, things that have been out for a while. You know, not not the uh, not the new fair. You know, not the not the. Uh, I mean, I do want to see some of the new stuff, and I'll be honest, I haven't watched like anything Marvel at all. Like, I, I've watched Iron Man one, I think. And I think I watched pieces of Iron Man 2. But that was about it. I haven't really watched any of the any of the Marvel movies. All of those all those movies that everyone raves about that come out two or three times a year. I haven't seen any of the new Star Wars movies. Like I am significantly behind on a, on a good deal of this uh, of this pop culture. So Disney Plus may very well be worth it in order to kind of catch me up a little bit. And let me see some of the stuff. And also, you know, a little bit of nostalgia. Be able to dig into my childhood a little bit. Some of the stuff I haven't seen in a very long time. And uh, it would be fun to kind of listen along. So we watched some of those. Got to see my favorite scene in Bed, no Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. I was always a uh, tremendously big fan of uh, the battle scene with the with the enchanted suits of armor. Uh, I always thought that was one of the coolest things with some of the best gags, I think. Some of the jokes they did with those were uh, fantastic. Like, they, they, they had some good quality writing. You know, decent slapstick. Like, they, they kind of had a good idea of what they wanted to do with that movie. And I greatly, uh, I greatly approve and appreciate. So being able to see that was absolutely a pleasure. And then after that, uh, the next movie they're they're actually they're, they're showing it now. I'm not actually really listening in on it. Um, I've been paying off and on attention uh, to the movie as I've been playing uh, playing League. But uh, they did a they're watching the Fantastic Beasts movie, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, the uh, the newer Harry Potter franchise. And uh, I don't know how I feel about it. I don't know if it's that I'm just not as into it because Harry Potter is 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 the magical world that I'm into. Like you, you, have, you, we went to. That's. Come here. Aha! I caught a banded dragonfly. But Harry Potter is the the magical world that I was into. I read it as a kid i read it for a very long time we actually went to the uh to the to the wizarding world of harry potter or whatever it's called the uh the universal studios uh thing we went there um year and a half ago uh as part of a christmas vacation and i had the biggest grin on my face you don't even understand like i was having so much fun wandering around uh you know just looking at everything, uh, you know, checking every shop naturally, and buying a good couple of things, trying out butterbeer and everything like that. But you know, like just looking around and going, "Wow, this is cool." We we, we sat in line for three hours to go on the uh, the Green Green Gods ride, which was pretty cool. But there was just a lot of these little things that just felt really excellent about that. And that's the you know part of it is what I grew up on. I grew up on Harry Potter. But also part of it was just like, you know, this they did so well in, in bringing it to the real world. Uh, Hogsmeade felt 
the same way. You know, walking through that, being able to use the wand that, because you know, I had to buy a wand. Actually, uh, me and my sister both bought one. Uh, and uh, I didn't much want to use the wands myself, but being able to kind of convince uh, my sister to use the wand and then watching just her face light up as she did it was awesome. So these are, you know, these are movies and books that I'm really big into, you know, that I really appreciate. Yeah, I cannot tell you the amount of joy I've gotten out of them. And I've just been kind of off and on watching Fantastic Beasts. And it's different in a way I don't like. And it's not that it's a different location, time period, and character. Like, that's not really the problem. The entire tone of the movie is extremely different. It's a lot more adult. And I don't know if that's what they were intending, but th this is this is no longer... You know, it's no longer a coming-of-age story. It's no longer a... Um, it, it's no longer this ongoing story of characters I know or locations I'm interested in. Everything is different from top to bottom. Uh, which, I don't know. Th there's also, like, just a lot of tension in the movie. Like, stuff is wrong from the get-go. You know, police action and a mystery and a lot of nonsense, you know. And honestly, I'm not a tremendously big fan of Newt Scamander as a character from, from the bits I've seen of him. He seems just uninteresting. Uh, and, uh... Just not a fun main character, you know? And I, you know, I I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, like... You know, watching this, there's a lot of cool stuff. We get to see a lot of cool magic. We get a lot to see a lot of cool creatures. We get to see a lot of a lot more interactions of what the wizarding world is like. But we go from... Uh, we go from England, which, while not a utopia in the movies by any means... Um, you know, stuff is not absolutely not perfect. But there's a scene I'm watching right now where they're actively, uh, I guess, doing the memory sieve thing from people with their wands. But it's in this really weird white clinical clinical looking area. Uh, the people look scared, like they're being attacked. Like this is. If things are things are fearful. Things are just legitimately and extensively unpleasant. It, 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 it there is a little bit of a sense of wonder when some things happen, but it, there's a it's not you know again England in Hogwarts was not a utopia, but it was generally pleasant and happy and enjoyable. You got some time to kind of enjoy uh, a pleasant. Uh, you know, setting before things go wrong. Whereas in this movie, it looks like things just are wrong from the, from the get-go. Like, everything is wrong straight out of, uh... Um... Straight out of the door. Again, it, it, it definitely took this sharp left turn and said we are this is no longer like this is no longer you know a, a kid friendly universe we, we this is this is an adult story now and i don't know how i feel about that with harry potter like i don't know if uh like not you know let's not lie the the, the original harry potter books are not always happy you know we have the dementors we harry's an orphan right off the bat there are absolutely things in the original books, in the original movies, that are not um, not all happy and everything like that. But it doesn't feel like this movie ever has that sense of, like, normalcy and pleasantness that I, you know, came to be used to. And having your main character arrested by secret police just immediately... Uh, probably has a good deal to do with that. My inventory is just continuously full. I don't know. Like, I, 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 I suppose if they're... 
if this is meant to be a completely different thing, it's meant to be a completely different thing. But this very much feels like it's trying to... I don't know, change how things work in the Harry Potter universe? I mean, I, hmm. it's, I feel the, uh, I feel the same way about this that I do about, um, I'm just watching this scene, it's just, uh, uh. but I, I feel the same way about this that I think I feel about, like, uh, Dead Rising 3 and uh, other kind of things of that ilk where the concept or storyline goes in a completely different direction, especially tone. Like, tone is this very, it's very, very important in, uh, in a lot of things. I was reading through, uh, Robert Asprin's uh, Myth series. Uh, I, ju I just finished rereading through it. Uh, I still recommend it, by the way, if you uh, if you guys have not uh, already jumped on it. But um, you know, I, I read, I was reading through it, and the very final book where it closes out the story, uh, it changes the the tone of the story in kind of a big way. Uh, not only do we do a little bit of uh, not necessarily not time traveling, because um, we don't time travel. But uh, it's chronological differences. Every book in the series, up until the very last one, is chronologically in order. And then the very last one is, is split into two kind of sub-stories. Uh, the first one is just a kind of a short story about just an adventure earlier on. But the problem is it kind of inserts this adventure in a place where there isn't really room for that adventure to exist. Um... You know, there are things the main characters learn and do in this adventure that makes things later make less sense if you take it chronologically. Because they would have known about things that they obviously didn't know about. It's just one of those things. It's going in and screwing with your, screwing with the, the you know, the history chronologically and trying to insert something in the middle where a character would learn something that, uh, would have helped him in a later adventure. So the tone was, and the tone of this story, in addition, not only because it was a, uh, you know, kind of included and kind of uh, added into, uh, you know, the chronology, but the tone of the story was very different. It was much less lighthearted uh, than the previous stories were. There were a fair amount of, um, you know, a fair amount of jokes. There were puns. Um, you know, these were all things that were in the previous books, but, uh, the, the story felt very, very different, uh, in ways that's really hard for me to describe, actually, just the, the writing felt different, the characters felt a little bit different, um, the adventure felt decidedly different than, uh, than the adventures we had seen so far. Uh, I, I think part of, part of what, um, uh, part of what I think made it different is that uh, the adventures felt... Don't lie to me. There we go. See, this, that's where I was going to put these, uh, these items, is down here. Kind of out of sight, out of mind. Christ, these things are big. And we, I don't think you can use those little rocky jetties anyways. Those little fjords. Is that what a fjord is? It probably isn't. I'm probably using that word wrong. But tone, tone is de definitely a, a thing. And I think when you, when you change the tone of an existing franchise, I always ask, like, why? Why would you... Why would you do this? Like, it's it's like putting, you know, guns in a Mario game. Uh, and, oh, 
you're sick. That's right. I need to get you medicine. Okay, I'll be back. It's like putting guns in a Mario game, and they so they did that. They did that in Mario versus Rabbids, but they also made that kind of its own thing. You know, when they when they did uh, Mario RPG and stuff like that, they it was its own thing. But like Mario Two, for example, Super Mario World Two, or whatever it was, um, the decidedly different thing. It makes me wonder, like, why would you do that? Why would you change? You're you're effectively changing the rules, right? You're you're adjusting how the rules of the uh, of the game work, changing things as a uh, you know. It just ugh. Like, I'm, I'm watching, they're in a scene right now where they're in, I guess, a cabaret or something like that. And you, you, you wouldn't picture this scene in the original, the original, uh, you know, septopology? I mean, octology, really, because the final movie was split into two pieces. But, um, this is, they're in a speakeasy. Like, you, you'd never, you'd never see this. Just a very different feel. And I always ask myself, like, why wouldn't you make this its own thing? I mean, I guess you can go and say, like, this is this is not Harry Potter anymore. This is the, the Wizarding World, and this is a new series in it. Which I guess is a legitimate statement. You know, I, I can't argue against that. What time is it? Oh, crap. I, I might not buy turnips this week. I, I, I don't know if there's a... Like, at 101 bells per turnip. Getting a return on that. It's gonna be kind of ridiculous. I don't know. I might check with, uh... With some friends in earlier time zones. Or later time zones. And have them check their prices for me. And maybe go join one of them if I'm going to, uh... If I'm gonna do the turnip thing. Just doesn't seem worth it today. I've always been kind of one to say that if you're gonna if you're gonna radically change how something works or the tone or the setting or something like that, uh, Dead Rising Three was was I think one of the examples that I bring up the most, uh, simply because of the um, changing to how a lot of things work, changing to how you know you can save anywhere, not just in bathrooms. Uh, survivors were very very different, things like that. You know, I was, I'm always of the opinion that if you're going to make such a massive change, why are you still working within the bounds of an existing intellectual property? Why aren't you making your own thing or making it its own thing? You know, it, it's I, I feel the same way with Nintendo a lot when they do, like, Kirby's Epic Yarn. Uh, that wasn't originally a Kirby game, as far as my, I understand. Like, they, add, they put Kirby in because they wanted to put a main character in to just kind of sell the game better. But, uh... I mean, it was... Wh why do that? I'm, I'm never happy when companies and things do that. Sup, Savannah? Have a thing. Uh, have a cone. Later. I, don't know, I might be a little bit too sensitive about it, but it definitely feels, at the end of the day for me, that uh, it's much harder to enjoy something like that, where they've taken this grand departure. Like, I think that's what a lot of people did not like about Bioshock Infinite, for example, was that the tone was extremely different. The style was very different. You know, yes, 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 um... Yes, 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 weapons and, uh, you know, yes, yes, the fact that you, you know, only were able to wield two weapons as opposed to, uh, your entire weapon wheel and plasmids were different and, you know, all, all, all that stuff that, that is absolutely true and valid, yes. 
Uh, I'm not going to argue any of that. But I think it was the tone. I, I think legitimately, I think realistically, it, the reason people were not happy was because the tone was very different. It was no longer this mystery or exploring. It was no longer learning... Um, It was no longer learning, like, the realities of um, the world that you're in. It was just go explore this kind of living world. It was, it was no longer the retroactive, slowly piece together the remains of a civilization uh, feel. It was very much now go explore a living world. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's, you know... I enjoyed them. But it was very much, you know, they they left it the Bioshock series because it did include a lot of the same elements, but they named it Bioshock Infinite. So it was a different, like, same series, but different line, I guess. As I said, I, I didn't mind it. I thought it was a a fine uh, a fine game. I do intend to play it for you guys at some point, but I say that about a lot of games. So let's see. Apart from that, uh, I did go and start reading Thunderer again. Uh, talking about it in general just kind of made me realize that, hey, I'm between books. I'm yawning an awful lot. I apologize. But I'm, I'm between books. Um, you know, I've got nothing to read right now. And as such... L let me go reread this book. I've been talking about it a lot on, you know... On a couple episodes. Let me go reread it. L let me see how it feels. L you know... D do, do I still feel, after reading, you know, the, the way that I did previously? And it's definitely too early for me to, you know, completely judge the book. Um, a lot of the thoughts that I, that I had mentioned in uh, either yesterday's upload or the upload before, I can't remember. But, um, yeah, a lot of the stuff I mentioned is definitely still there. Uh, I'm definitely still of the opinion that uh, Arjun is just kind of this bleh reactionary character. He just doesn't, he just doesn't do anything. You know, I mean, I'm 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 a third I'm a third of way through the book. Um, maybe a little bit further than that, actually, if I think about it. Maybe maybe forty percent, forty five percent through the book. Um, you know, stuff has happened, but it's just kind of stuff is happening around him. Makes him feel like a bit of a wet blanket. Uh, Jack continues to be a really cool character. I forgot there was this entire subplot about the commander of the flying ship. So, reading through that. And, uh, you know, it's... The writing, I think, is maybe... Ooh, gold armor. Cool. Is that something I can wear, or is that a, a furniture piece? Ooh. Nice. The writer, the, the writing feels a little bit more juvenile than I had, uh, than I remembered. It's not bad by any means, but it, it, do, it definitely does not feel as deep necessarily as it could be in terms of like content. Uh, that said, the world building is done extraordinarily well. I was reading through and I was really impressed uh, actually by how the writer sets up the city to feel like it has a history and like it has a, a background and uh, stuff going on. Um, really, the, the big thing they did, which I, I found 
and it's a, it's a really simple trick, but it's it's really effective, is that the writer keeps on just naming places. Now, it's not necessarily like a word vomit sort of thing, because, you know, that doesn't really work out all that well. But, you know, the writer kind of talks about locations in the city, and he gives them names, and then just gives it kind of this very small description of what that may be. Uh, he talks about, you know, there, there's a, uh, there's a, there's an open market, uh, that one of the characters visits for a bit. And there's these extremely giant stone wheels in this open market that, uh, according to the lore, uh, were used for human sacrifices. Uh, it doesn't really explain kind of how that works, but uh, there is kind of this this lore bit of, yeah, you know, this is a thing that exists. So that's already neat enough, but then... It's, it's like each of these, like, seven giant stone wheels. Like, they're huge, apparently. Um, they each have a name, and the, the author names, like, four of the seven, uh, you know, stone wheels... We don't get a description of how it looks. We don't get a description of, you know, what it's like. Um, or really what makes it important. But it's just like, you know, uh, he started looking around this stone wheel at the at, at the uh, clothiers. And he looked around, you know, it was, it was around the, you know, uh, the lusting wheel was the, you know, the uh, the whorehouses. But it, it's this thing where just like just naming it, na naming the, you know, he walked along and marveled at the churches of Anchor Tor, or whatever it is. So it it had this, uh, it ends up making this, this feel where there is a history to the world that we may not be aware of. It may not be kind of transmitted to the reader, but it makes it feel like there's more world that you, that you may not have been, been aware of. Uh, which I think is really cool. It, it's it's a really it is a really cheap trick. You can't really do it too much. I think um, you have to be very careful with a trick like this because if you do it too much, it feels like you're being lazy, not bothering to describe anything. But he t he spends time on some locations that are actually important, and others he just name drops. But that name drop gives you a sense of connectedness and a sense of fullness to the world. Which, uh... Yeah, I think it's excellent. So I'm reading through, you know, n naturally because I've read through the story before. Uh, I do know where the story's going. I do know how the story ends. Uh, so none of that's going to come as a surprise. But also, I definitely find that, uh... And I, I found this when watching Bedknobs and Broomsticks, actually. Um... Some of the stuff I read a long time ago, Thunderer was a uh, was a brand new book when I first read it. It had been out for maybe a couple of months. That was in 2008, so that was 12 years ago. Uh, so what this means is that I have you know I've not read this book for 12 years. I am a massively different person at almost 32 than I was at, you know, 19 to 20. I, I have much more experience in the world. I've interacted with things more. Uh, and that really, a lot of things change for me. I mean, uh, you know, this book, I, I'm understanding more about what's going on. I kind of, I, I empathize with different characters a little bit more than I did uh, previously. Uh, but, you know, really, Bedknobs and Brooms, I think, was, was, the, was another thing uh, entirely. And it's one of the reasons I like going back and, like, playing through games again or watching movies again or reading books again that I haven't read in a couple of years. Because I find that as I get older, as I experience more, learn more, interact more with, uh, you know, with things and stuff, uh... As I do more of this, I find that it, I I see more in these media than I ever did. Watching Bed Knobs and Broomsticks now and understanding the concept of why an exploded bomb was a big deal, or uh, or sorry, an unexploded bomb, 
um, understanding how big of a deal that actually is, uh, understanding more in a fairly large way about uh, the characters in question. Um, I mean, r really, really understanding Angela Lansbury's character a lot better and her motivations, understanding more about Mr. Brown and his motivations, and kind of understanding what type of, like, charlatan he he really is. And he is, he's, he's a tremendous charlatan, but he's he's kind of like that charlatan with the heart of gold sort of feel, especially as you get later on into the, uh, into the movie. Uh, but kind of understanding more about how these interactions work. Uh, and how, you know, how, how the history is, too. I know a lot more about, uh, I think it's World War One is when that takes place. I can't remember if it's World War One or World War II. Um, but, uh, I actually, no, it's World War Two, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but I understand a lot more about, you know, kind of the history of the world. I understand more about World War Two than I did, uh, when I, you know, when I last saw that movie. I understand a lot more about, um... You know what what the you know what these kids had to go through or uh what you know you would have expected from like the military of the time so it definitely kind of puts things in a very different light uh which i find to be extremely cool like it's, it's something that i love to uh i love to see uh it's extremely interesting to see these these distinct differences Okay, what do we got? I don't know who are, uh, other than Daisy May, I don't know who our unique villager is today. Okay, what do we got? We already have the business suit coat. Pretty sure I already have a waistcoat. Do we have an embroidered pattern skirt? Folk dance outfit. Interesting. But it's 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 definitely one of those things where it's like, okay, I you know, part of it is I understand this a lot more, uh, from you know I understand the the concepts a lot more. I understand the uh the characters more. I understand I mean, there really is. There's a lot of things I understand better uh, as as an adult than I did as a kid. But there's also you you empathize with different people, uh, especially when you're when you're a kid. You know you you know you listen to uh, you know the kids in in Mary Poppins or Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, uh, and you or at least I I think I think you empathize more with the kids. You think that they have the right idea. Uh, you know, of, of, you know, mouthing off a little bit or being demanding or, you know, man, this sucks. Uh, but a as I get older, like, it's, you know, I empathize with the dad a lot or with Mary Poppins herself a lot uh, in the, uh, in Mary Poppins. Uh, it, you know, Mr. Brown and, uh, you know, um... Oh, crap, I can't remember Angela Lansbury's character's name. I literally just watched this movie. But I look at them, and I listen, I listen to their dialogue and how they interact with each other. And it's a very distinctly different um, story than you would necessarily expect uh, that the kids are not going to empathize with. Like, they don't understand what makes Mr. Brown, like, he, Mr. Brown's a, a completely, uh, charismatic character, so kids are gonna like him, but they're not gonna realize, like, who he is, or what he does, or why he's, you know, why he's different, uh, is it Mrs. Price? I think it's Mrs. Price. She's a, you know, she seems like a little bit of a shrew as a kid, but as an adult, like, I completely understand, the entire time, the entire movie, she's trying to get stuff together, so that way she can help push back the Nazis. This is her entire thing. As an adult, I understand that a lot better. And then, you know, as a kid, you might empathize a little bit, you know, and be upset when the kids are like, but we want you to be our dad. 
as an adult watching the end of that movie and watching him decide to go from a you know second rate snake oil salesman you know at best and watching him go from that and watching him enlist in um in the British army and uh you know get ready to go off to war uh I understand that a whole lot better, and I empathize it a whole lot better, uh, especially as he, you know, as he stops and kind of chucks the kid on the chin and says, "Hey, I will be, I'll be back before you've grown an inch." You know, n knowing what I know about, see, I already talked to Pietro. Knowing what I know about, you know, World War II, uh, and just war in general, but World War II especially. You know, how likely is it that he never came back at all? That was a huge thing, you know, then. So hearing these, uh, hearing these characters just a as a as an adult, as someone who has uh, experienced uh, a lot more in life, it definitely makes you look at some of the stuff in a very different light. You understand better, and as I said, you you uh, uh, you empathize better, and you empathize differently, in a very different way. Different characters grab your attention. Different characters seem to be the ones that actually have their heads on straight. I can't remember who I was. I was reading some, uh... I don't know if it was a review or if it was a fan fiction, but, you know... I've heard people say, like, they empathize with villains more than they empathize with the heroes, because, as they get older, because the villains seem to have actual righteous statements. Uh, there's a lot of these, uh, th you know, there's a lot of these, I empathize with, you know, with this put-upon character. I, th I think one of the ones that I, I remember hearing the most on, actually, I, I really appreciate this description, was uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where, you know, they say, when I was a kid, I empathized with Ferris. And then as I got older, I realized that Ferris is kind of an immature jerk and an asshole, and I really began to empathize more with with Cameron, uh, with how he was just not in control of his life, and uh, you know, trying to figure out why is he letting someone else control him, and why is he doing stuff he doesn't want to do. And they said as they got even older, they started empathizing more with uh, Principal Mooney, I think his name is, but they empathize with him because he is literally just trying to do his job to stop a child who is intensely truant. Uh, dangerously so and get him back into school like he's supposed to be like he is supposed to be by law and just terrible things keep on happening to this principal uh and to be fair he is a little bit of a jerk he's a little bit of an asshole and he does deserve some of the nonsense that goes his way but there's a lot of crap that happens to him that he doesn't deserve at all he's just doing his job he might be a little bit you know over enthusiastic about it but but, like, as as you get older, you, you empathize with some of these characters, you know, a little bit differently. Uh, a lot of us, uh, you know, going back to Harry Potter, the, the original uh, topic here, you know, a lot of us thought Harry and Hermione were the coolest. And a lot of us really, uh, you know, really thought that uh, Dumbledore was amazing. But as you get older, you realize that the true badasses in the books were, you know, people like Neville people like uh McGonagall and uh and Lupin. Uh those were the and uh serious for me. I don't know if I don't know if everybody else agrees with that. But these were the characters that these are the ones that you empathize with. These were the the true characters that, you know, the really heroes. Uh even though the book is not really told from their point of view. I as I said, I find it different. Like as I get older, as I read through things, I, I see more. Uh, there are definitely books I read as a kid, uh, and I, I've read a lot of adult books as a kid, so there is, uh, or adult-aimed books, I guess is the better way to say that. But I did read a bunch of books as a child that were definitely, uh, above my, above my knowledge at the time. And what that ended up meaning is that there were a bunch of, like, jokes or topics that I just didn't understand. They just didn't make sense to me. Uh, because I just didn't know what they were about. Like, and th there's nothing wrong with that. I just, I just did not know And as I get older and I spend more time uh, learning and going back, I do get to 
understand this stuff a lot better. I guess a darn dragonfly. I was hoping for another one of those banded ones because those are the ones that are actually worth a fair amount. Well, as usual, we reached the end of our time. We talked about a lot of things. Have, you know, have you guys ever lost a pet and found it again? Uh, I'm actually considering getting a second dog to be a companion to my current dog. Everybody in my family is talking about doing this. My uh, sister is trying to convince her boyfriend to adopt a dog. Uh, so the topic keeps on coming up. But, um... You know, have you guys ever lost, uh, lost a pet that you then found again? Is a big question. Uh, and then I, I guess the other major question is, you know, how do you feel about these... You know, these media franchises that feel a need to kind of reinvent themselves or to completely diversify in in future uh you know future installments i know that if we look at something like um well that was disappointing i know if we look at something like rocky you know there was that one rocky that had the robot and crap like that so that was that's definitely going to be a thing there uh, but, um, you know, how, how do you guys feel about that? Do you feel like these should be different franchises? Maybe they shouldn't have made it at all in the first place. Or maybe they're absolutely fine, and I'm just not thinking this through. God, you freaking nonsense. Give me the mahi-mahi. <laughs> just, just give it to me. And then, you know, have you guys revisited some of your old, you know, childhood media? You know, those video games, those movies, books, what have you, as an adult, and then really learned, you know, these these big differences, realized that, you know, as an adult, you know more. And really, what what was it? What did you what did you revisit with with your with your newfound adult knowledge that allowed you to relearn some of this stuff? It would be kind of interesting to hear. But yeah, leave me comments. I read every last one of them. I reply when I can. I love hearing from you guys. If you like this video, please hit the like button. It definitely helps me out. It makes it easier for other people to find the video. So if you liked it, we can make sure someone else has a chance to see it. If you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. Those La Mulana videos I've been promising are finally going up, which means that I am uploading, well, not really uploading, but I'm currently publishing three videos a day for y'all. So there's lots and lots of content for you guys. And you guys can catch me on Twitch every once in a while. Links in the description. Come join me. Come talk with me. I like talking to you guys in real time. There's my dog. But uh, I love talking to you guys in real time, and I would love to talk to you guys more directly. You can also head over to that Discord link, which is also in the description. And that's a great way to hear from me when we are actually starting to uh, do stuff. But thanks for watching, y'all. I'll see you guys next time.